Well, welcome everybody to the uh, Dean's Benefit for Student Scholarships. I'm so happy you could join us. Uh, really appreciate your support of the school. Obviously, we, we wish we could do this in person. And I know that everybody is uh, kind of Zoomed out, uh, experiencing Zoom fatigue, um, but we're happy that you're able to join us nonetheless. Um, we're, we're having the, the, um, uh, the next Dean's Dinner in the fall, so we hope you can attend that. Um, and. Uh, uh, we really appreciate your, your participation in, a, in what has been a, a challenging year, um, but a year in which um, you all have risen to the occasion and the law school has done very well. Um, so I am thrilled uh, that we have um, a really outstanding alum with us, the Honorable Brendan Carr. Um, uh, Brendan um, has been a great partner with the law school in, uh, in doing events with us and, and uh, in giving back. Um, and he, um, I'll just introduce him uh, since he's the main event. Um, he's a commissioner of the Federal Communications Commission. He was nominated by President Trump in 2017 and confirmed unanimously, um, which is nice for this age, uh, by the United States Senate later that year. Um, previously, he had served as the general counsel of the Federal Communications Commission. At the FCC, he focuses on regulatory reforms that will help create jobs and grow the economy for the benefit of all Americans. He's been leading the FCC's work to secure US leadership in 5G technology. Um, his reforms are predicted to cut billions of dollars in regulatory red tape and have already accelerated a 5G build outs, uh, helping to bring more broadband to more Americans. Um, he's also focused on expanding America's skilled workforce um, for example, the tower climbers and construction crews needed to build next-gen networks. Uh, his jobs initiative promotes community colleges, technical schools, and apprenticeships as a pipeline for good-paying 5G jobs. Uh, and he is recognizing America's talented and hardworking tower crews through a special series he's doing of 5G-ready hard hat presentations. Um, Brendan is a leading uh, FCC is also leading an FCC telehealth telehealth initiative, which is designed to drive down healthcare costs while improving outcomes for veterans, low income and rural Americans. Uh, Brendan brings a dozen years of private and public sector experiences in communications and tech policy to his role as commissioner. He first joined the FCC as a staffer back in 2012 and worked on spectrum policy and competition matters for a number of FCC offices. Uh, prior to joining the agency, he worked as an attorney at Wiley Ryan in the firm's appellate litigation and telecom practices. He litigated cases involving the First Amendment and the Communications Act. He's a graduate of Georgetown University, and he clerked on the US Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit for Judge Dennis W. Shedd. He graduated magna cum laude from our law school, uh, the Catholic University of America, Columbus School of Law, where he served as an editor of the Catholic University Law Review. He grew up in Virginia, now lives in Washington, DC with his alumna wife and three children, um, and we're incredibly grateful to have him here. And I give you uh, the Honorable Brendan Carr. Oh, well, thank you uh, so much, Dean, for that uh, very, very kind introduction. I know this is always one of the, the standout events of the year. I, I want to start by really commending you, Dean Payne, and your team for what you've been doing the last year and a half. I, I know with, with COVID-19, all of our lives have been just completely upended, uh, but your team has been doing a great job of not only keeping the law school running, uh, but improving the law school. I think we've talked before about 
uh, the numbers that are really turning around for the school. So a point in time when it could be very difficult uh, for institutions to succeed. You know, you've been finding a way to generate the fundraising activity, to invest in the students, to invest in the faculty. And I think we're starting to see that pay off. So uh, really kudos to you and your leadership uh, during this period of time. Uh, I know probably- Thank you so much. And I, I do really have a great team. Um, and, and of course our, our staff and faculty who are outstanding couldn't do it without the help of our, our very supportive alumni. So really, really appreciate everyone's support. Exactly. You can see you can see some of them, I think, are, are arrayed on the screen right now. I think at this point in time in the pandemic, it is safe to say that we are all suffering uh, a bit from some Zoom fatigue. I think uh, single tasking has become one of the most underrated skills in today's uh, environment. It feels like we are always checking multiple screens, you know, text messages, uh, Twitter DMs, emails, and so our attention is sort of often split all over the place. But the good news is I think there are signs that uh, very soon we may be able to do these types of events uh, again in person. And I think that'd be a great thing. I certainly uh, would welcome that because speaking at length into a virtual or basically blank screen as I'm doing right now, uh, I often wonder in these types of events whether people are zoning out or sleeping uh, in the virtual audience. When we do these things in person, I don't have to wonder that at all. I just look up from the podium or the dais and I can assure myself that people are in fact sleeping or zoning out uh, in the audience. Uh, so I look forward to getting back to uh, being able to do these in person and obviously encourage everyone to get their vaccine so we can all do that uh, soon enough. Uh, in terms of my story, I'll give you a little bit about uh, my experience, some of what we're working on at the FCC right now. It's, it's a privilege to serve in this job. At this point in time, there are so much interesting things going on, not just in telecom, but in sort of the public uh, sector generally in our politics that the FCC touches on. Uh, for my own part, I'm sort of a rare Washingtonian, as the dean indicated. I grew up in uh, Virginia, not too far from DC. And I did my undergrad at what, at least when I was at Catholic, we called uh, one of the terrible Georges at Georgetown University. And after I graduated from Georgetown, I decided to spend a year as a paralegal to see if I really wanted to go into law. So I was a paralegal at Venable for a year uh, and I worked in their energy practice. And I quickly realized that you know energy uh, wasn't the right practice for me, but there was something interesting about regulatory law in that practice. And really just by chance, my office happened to be next to uh, a partner who would go on to be a general counsel of a media company, Bob Beiser. And he walked into my office and said, you know, I hear you're thinking about going to law school. I want to put a bug in your ear about Catholics Law School. Their reputation for training lawyers, particularly in the telecom space, and then giving them a pathway to land a rewarding job in DC is unparalleled. Uh, and even though I grew up in DC, uh, Catholic uh, was among the schools that I was thinking about, but it was hearing from someone that was a practicing lawyer in this space, talking about the practical skills that you get at Catholic and the ability to leverage that into an actual job, which is a, you know, a 20-year-old uh, kid with significant debt coming out of Georgetown. That was something I was interested in. So I did apply. I did go to uh, Catholic, obviously and enrolled in the telecom program. And it was everything that it was pitched as being. You know, wonderful adjunct professors that we can lean on and bring in given our location in DC. A real emphasis, not just on the academic side, we certainly get that uh, at Catholic, but an emphasis on the practical skill sets so that you can take your law degree and go get a job and practice in this space. And I think there's a lot of law schools that over the years seem like they have lost track of that important piece of going to school. Uh, and so I had just a, a wonderful time at Catholic. I got the chance to uh, intern while I was there. I did an internship on Capitol Hill for the telecom subcommittee. I did an internship here at the FCC uh, for the Enforcement Bureau. And I got to do an internship for another Catholic alum, uh, then Commissioner Kathleen Abernathy. And I got to do an internship in her office and I remember thinking, you know, what a tremendous honor it was to get to go into the FCC, go up to what we call the eighth floor where the commissioner's offices were, you know, sit in the intern pen and, and work. And I remember like 
having no idea what I was talking about. I was reading legal briefs and comments submitted to the FCC, and I would try to brief the commissioner. And in hindsight, it's, it's embarrassing, but you do the best you can as a law school student. Uh, flash forward, obviously, about 15 years uh, to where I'm a commissioner of the FCC, and just by luck, the office that I'm assigned to as a commissioner is the exact same office that Commissioner Abernathy had when I interned for her. And so every day when I would come into the building, when we used to come in every single day, uh, the first thing I would do was I would physically walk past the intern pen uh, where I worked as an intern during my time at Catholic. And it was a great reminder every single day of the opportunities that have arisen uh, thanks to the foundation uh, provided by Catholic. I know all of us here have a passion for Catholic and that's why we give our time. Uh, that's why some of you uh, give your money. Uh, maybe one day when I get out of public sector, I'll have more of that to, uh, to give back to the school. But at the moment, I will focus on giving my time uh, because we see something valuable here. So Catholic changed my life. Uh, it changed my life in more ways than just professionally. As the dean indicated, when I was a, a 3L at law school, uh, I started dating one of my classmates uh, as a 3L, and we shared a class, uh, Conflict of Laws. Uh, I know it's really hard to imagine a more romantic environment than one of Professor Perez's classes. At least that's how uh, I found it uh, when I met my now wife and we started dating. Uh, ironically enough, Professor Perez almost immediately indicated um, or, or, or discovered, I should say, uh, that my now wife and I had just started dating. And so in one of the very first classes, he you know, used the Socratic method where he would stand up one student next to the other student to debate two sides of a case. Uh, in the case, which is now uh, seared very deeply into my memory was a case called uh, Bernard versus Harris Club. And this was a case that had to do with two people from California who traveled to Nevada to go to a casino. And the details were they ended up drinking too much, they got in a car accident. And there was a question about whether California law or Nevada law would apply to the resolution, would, would provide the rule of decision for that case. I tell you that now not to make you worry that there's some sort of a quiz or test that's gonna come having to do with conflict of laws later, but because all of that is information that I did not know the day that Professor Press stood up my now wife and me to take opposite sides of that case and debate it. Uh, my wife typically of the time then and now was completely prepared for that exchange, principally because she had read the case, done the homework ahead of time. Uh, I typically of the time then, maybe less so now, I don't know, had not prepared, had not read the case at all. And so for about 10 minutes, Professor Perez, uh, uh, without showing any mercy, um, uh, went back and forth with me and my now wife in, in an exchange in which I was just completely embarrassed uh, and blown away because I had not read the case. I had no arguments uh, and it was fairly embarrassing. But at the end of the day, it worked out very, very well. We're now married, obviously. Uh, we've got three amazing boys, a seven-year-old Quinn, a uh, four-year-old Emmett, uh, an 18-month-old uh, Lachlan. So just a tremendous, tremendous uh, personal blessing, obviously. After graduating law school, uh, I went to work for Wiley Rhine, which uh, at the time, I won't say at the time because it sounds like I'm making a value judgment, was known as uh, one of the preeminent uh, communications practices and got very good practical experience building on what I learned at Catholic. After three years, I left, uh, did a clerkship down on the Fourth Circuit, uh, as Dean Payne indicated, and then I came back to Wiley for another three years. Uh, and in 2012, I decided to go into uh, the government. I wanted to get some experience at the FCC, given that I was interacting with the FCC in private practice, representing clients before the FCC. So I thought I'd go to the agency, work for two or three years, then come back out to a law firm. I guess we're about nine years, almost 10 years uh, forward since then, and I'm still here. I've had tremendous opportunity at the FCC. As I indicated, I started as just a, a staffer in the Office of General Counsel. Uh, I then had the opportunity to work for then Commissioner Ajit Pai. And then when uh, uh, Commissioner Pai was named Chairman of the FCC in 2017, he named me General Counsel of the FCC. 
which was one of the best jobs I've ever had, getting to work uh, as a general counsel of an agency, uh, overseeing a team of about 80 lawyers who you know, know the substantive areas inside and out was just uh, the job of a lifetime. Then I got nominated by the president uh, to be a commissioner, go through the Senate confirmation process, um, which can be both fun and not fun, depending on the timing and, and the perspective, and then became a commissioner here in 2017. Uh, and it's been just a, a tremendous, tremendous, um, really rewarding experience to get to participate uh, in the regulation of this dynamic part um, of our economy. Uh, it is nothing that I ever set out to do when I was a law student. It's nothing that I set out to do when I was uh, in the Communications Institute or interning here, but the foundation that was provided by Catholic, the network that is provided, we call it, hopefully it's not pejorative anymore, but, uh, in the telecom bar, it's called the Catholic Mafia. We look out for each other. Uh, when we find out about jobs, we let people know. I have a lot of mentors uh, that went to Catholic still. I consult with them whenever I had an opportunity to make a change in my career. In this job, I try to hire people um, that have the experiences and, that really you only get going to Catholic. And one of my newest um, advisors, uh, Danielle uh, Thuman, who I think is on the, uh, the video here, is a relatively recent, more recent than me at least, uh, Catholic alum, and she's doing uh, fantastic work uh, in public service here at the FCC already. Uh, so that's a little bit uh, about sort of my career path and sort of what I've been up to. And I thought maybe uh, as the last part of my filibuster here, uh, I'd focus on you know one element um, of an issue that I'm observing, you know, sitting on the perch here at the FCC, which has to do with free speech and sort of public debate or debate that is taking place in the modern day public square. For a lot of us, if we look back, uh, you know, 10, 20 years, we had a lot of a, uh, what I would call sort of a common shared experience when it came to the consumption of news and information. And some of that was because of scarcity, right? We had uh, very few channels. You would uh, tune in at night to sort of the Walter Cronkite uh, nightly news broadcast. We read basically the same newspapers and there was sort of a common set of ideas, a common set of, of principles, a, a common conversation that we would all have. I don't describe that in sort of a, a sort of a rose colored glasses perspective or a, a Pollyannish nature. There's good sides to that and there's bad sides to that. But I say it to contrast, I think where we are today in terms of our culture of not just free speech, but of discussion of public issues. And what strikes me is happening today is we are moving from the center of that public square and increasingly we are separating into the corners of that public square. And there's a couple of features of that. Uh, for, 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 for one, you know, a lot of, I think the national news media discussion that we consume whether it's on Twitter, whether it's on cable news, uh, increasingly strikes me as, as, as something that approximates, you know, sheep dogging people towards preferred political narratives. I think that that objective gumshoe reporting, you know, the objective digging into facts, presenting it to people is something that is either slipping away in our culture or is otherwise being replaced by outlets that are starting to identify more with sort of tribal or partisan aspects. And again, I don't say that as a, as a judgment or as a comparison and contrast from a value perspective of the past. I say that as an observation of what's going on right now. Where you don't see that is local news, uh, community newspapers, uh, local radio. I think that's where you still see a lot of sort of original journalism, a lot of digging in, a lot of reporting but I do think we have this effect at the national discussion where things are splintering. And we see that at the FCC. It's very rare that a day goes by that I don't get an email to me at the FCC uh, from someone on the left and someone on the right. This happens equally across the political spectrum saying, I saw this on cable news. I don't think that you know, this coverage was fair. Can you FCC step in and pull the license of this uh, uh, cable channel? Can you? shut down this speaker over there. It is from the left, it is from the right, 
there is this sort of intolerance, I think, that has arisen to hearing diversity of views in different perspectives. I think one of the important things for people to realize is it is not the role of the government, either from a First Amendment perspective or what I think is a, is a sort of a, a, a leaving room for a diversity of views perspective for us to come in and uh, put a thumb on the scale. But it does feel like increasingly people are reflexively looking to the FCC. We see Republicans do it. We see Democrats do it and trying to use us uh, to shut down political views that they don't like. And I think that's a dangerous trend. It's a dangerous precedent. And I think we all need to sort of speak up and try to sort of um, create space where people of differences of opinion uh, can, air those, uh, uh, can air those views. As to the future, I think in the near term, we're gonna continue to see a splintering. I think you're gonna to continue to see people that are gonna find either social media sites or news outlets that largely confirm their existing perspectives and their existing biases. And I'm not sure that's a great long-term trend, but I do think that's where we seem to be headed, at least in the short term. And I do think there's something that all of us can play with respect to that cultural trend, which is to continue to talk to each other. I think longer form uh, interactions like we're doing here is amenable to it. It's really hard when you're on Twitter not to just you know, fire off you know, some sort of high level snarky comment um, as someone that lives in that space and is in that environment. You know, I certainly am, have been susceptible to that uh, type of a dynamic. I think it's incumbent on us as a culture though to try to bridge the divides by talking to each other, hearing each other out and trying to get back to a more sort of reasoned uh, debate on these matters of, uh, of public opinion. So uh, all of that is, uh, is to sort of end the, the filibuster portion of this. And I'm happy to talk with Dean Payne more about that. I'm happy to move into more of the substantive work we do here at the FCC from 5G to infrastructure builds uh, to telehealth, which we've been very active in at the FCC, particularly, particularly over the last year with COVID-19. Again, as our lives basically shifted onto the internet overnight, there was a massive spike in, uh, in telehealth. And we've played a role at the FCC to try to enable that. Um, and real quickly, I'll just tell maybe a, a short story there before I, before I turn it over. Um, a couple of years ago, I was in uh, the Mississippi Delta, a very small town called Ruleville. And I met a woman there by the name of Miss Annie who first saw the signs of diabetes when she woke up one morning with blurred vision. She told me that she wasn't getting much progress with traditional care methods, but there was an innovative pilot program that sent her home with a, uh, an iPad and a Bluetooth connected blood glucose monitor. And every morning in her home, she'd prick her finger, it would send her uh, A1C blood level to her iPad and she'd get instant feedback right there. You know, eat this today, exercise this way, don't eat this today and she saw market improvement. And from hearing her story, I took that back to the FCC, I pitched my colleagues, and we started this process of standing up a new pilot program to support what we call connected care, which is telehealth connections to patients wherever they are, not just in a hospital. Because for years at the FCC, we had supported uh, connections to brick and mortar facilities, which we're still doing, but I thought we needed to pick up on that new trend, which is the delivery of care wherever people are, wherever they have a smartphone or an iPad. So we started that program and right when COVID-19 hit, we'd done the legwork and we were able to stand up uh, an emergency COVID-19 telehealth program uh, to help support uh, uh, healthcare providers as we saw this ramp up to remote connected care technologies. And I was recently back in Ruleville about two or three weeks ago. Uh, I got to reunite with Miss Annie. She's still doing great um, and she was just, tickled that, you know, this corner of Mississippi Delta, this innovative idea that she had been part of, that she had been a vocal advocate for, uh, had found its way back to DC and was then providing the baseline that was really supporting our nationwide response to COVID-19 by letting people get care in their home rather than going to facility. And I, I describe it to people as the, the healthcare equivalent of shifting from blockbuster video to Netflix, right? You don't have to go to a brick and mortar facility anymore you can get that care delivered right to you. So it's driving down healthcare costs and improving outcomes. And it's one of the um, you know, more satisfying uh, issues that we get a chance to work on here at the FCC. 
Oh, thanks so much, Commissioner. Uh, really uh, appreciate that your remarks. Um, how's the new building at the FCC? The uh, chat wants to know. Yeah, well, we did move during the, the pandemic. So what had been historically the eighth floor of the commissioners is now the 10th floor. It's a little tighter quarters, but it's a, a very modern new building. I'm in the building right now, uh, but we're still under a work from home policy for staff, which will last at least through uh, September. Okay, um, Chad also wants to know some questions from Doug here. You have been in the majority on the commission for the majority of your career as an FCC commissioner. How are you adjusting now being in the minority? And what would you describe as your greatest accomplishment? What would you describe as your greatest accomplishments as an FCC commissioner? So the FCC is uh, those steeped in it know, and maybe those that aren't don't know, it's a five member commission. And so generally there's three members that are of the same political party as the president and then two that are the opposite. So when I started, I was one of three Republicans in the majority. Right now we're two, two, we have two Democrats, two Republicans, and we're waiting uh, for President Biden to nominate a third Democrat. So at the moment, I have not made the full transition into a minority. We are uh, two, two, but I certainly uh, understand exactly where I'm headed. You know, the dynamic- but you're getting right revved now, by your colleagues, right? That's right. Right, right now the, the dynamic is a good one because at two, two, we're all compromising. We're all finding common ground. I think we're probably doing what the American people would, you know, largely expect in normal times. There's really not the opportunity for partisan decision making, and that's creating an environment in which I think we're all working towards the center, which is great. Because I think if you look in D.C. in general right now, the reward system for politicians is not to work to the center. Whether they're looking for contributions, whether they're looking to fire up their base, whether they're looking for you know cable news hits. The reward system right now is to move to a corner um, rather than being rewarded for finding common ground. So I think the FCC is in a unique spot right now being 2-2. And we'll see if that dynamic continues once we're back to, to full strength when there's a 3-2 possibility. Great, and, and uh, what about your greatest accomplishment? Do you what do you think that is as commissioner? You know, the telehealth work has been extremely satisfying to see that take place. And also the infrastructure side, when I was in the majority, I led the FCC's efforts to accelerate the build out of wireless infrastructure. And to give you one example of that, the build out of this type of infrastructure in the country had largely flatlined uh, in the lead up to 2017. In 2016, for instance, uh, providers built 708 new cell sites in this country. After we streamlined a lot of the regulations, you know, permitting, cutting red tape, that number jumped to over 46,000 new cell sites in 2019. So a 65-fold increase from 2016 to 2019. That was really satisfying to see, and not just as a, as a number sense, but again, as COVID hit this country, those new cell sites, plus all the new fiber that went in the ground to connect them, that took millions of people that had been on the wrong side of the digital divide and brought them across to have a high-speed connection that became vital for so many people during COVID-19. We aren't across the finish line yet. We haven't fully closed the digital divide. There's still millions of Americans that don't have service. So our work's not done, but it was satisfying to know that we accelerated infrastructure build outs um, so that people could get online when COVID did hit. Okay, um, another question from chat. With people increasingly able to participate in the media with just a computer or even a smartphone, bringing along people who may express themselves more crassly than one would expect from a journalist. How does the democratization of journalism impact the FCC's work? It's a good question. I think this is one of the, the most important features of the internet is it did away with traditional gatekeepers. So it used to be to sort of reach a large audience to move the needle from a public perception perspective. You needed to be on the New York Times or Washington Post um, or Wall Street Journal. And that was sort of institutions that played a gatekeeper role to decide what message to get out there, how to frame it. With the internet now, whether it's Twitter or Facebook, it provides the opportunity for people to go around those intermediaries and their ideas can be judged on their own merits. And there's good sides to that and bad sides. Some of the stuff that goes viral goes viral because it appeals to uh, sort of a, a base part of the body politic. So there's upsides to that, there's downsides to that. How it impacts our work at the FCC is 
there's a lot more diversity of views, diversity of perspectives and competition out there. So for instance, we used to have regulations that would very heavily regulate uh, the media landscape. We have rules that limit whether a newspaper, for instance, can own a TV station in the market, whether it can own a local newspaper, how many radio stations can be owned. And the whole reason for those heavy regulations was scarcity, very few ways to get views out there. And so we wanted to structurally regulate so there's different ownership to try to get to the idea of different perspectives. But when that is disrupted, when anybody with you know, an internet connection can start a podcast, um, get their viewpoints out there, I think that decreases the need for us to heavily regulate those more traditional uh, means of communicating. It also undermines the economic viability of those outlets. So for instance, local newspapers are closing by the dozen across the country. And, and why is that? Well, one feature of it is they were supported by ad revenue. And the rise of you know, Google and Facebook for all of the good that they bring to people's lives, just one upshot of that was that's those are ad supported services. So the local uh, uh, car dealership that used to advertise on, you know, in the local newspaper or the local radio station is shifting those ad dollars to Google or Facebook. Um, and that's having a negative impact in terms of the economic uh, sustainability of, of local news media. Great. Um, any other questions for Commissioner Carr? Well, Brennan, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, really appreciate your support um, and your terrific remarks and your service to the country. Um, and um, we too, uh, we don't want to, um, you know, you don't want your service cut short, but we too look forward to that that time when you, you know, re-enter private practice or something and, <laughs> <laughs> and are still engaged with the law school. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, terrific, uh, Brandon. Thanks so much. Um, and if we were in person, we'd give you a round of applause. Um, you'll have to settle for these, you know, reaction, um, uh, um, you know, emojis or whatever, whatever it is we should call them. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thanks. Well, terrific. Um, uh, the next part of our program is I get to um, to introduce uh, Nico Valderrama, uh, which is a, a, an honor and a pleasure for me. Um, he's uh, a, a law student at the school, um, class of, of 2021, um, which means that he's graduating this year. Um, and in person, we might add, uh, which we're very, very happy about uh, that we're able to offer um, a form of uh, in-person commencement this year um, to these graduates who have so who so well deserve it. Um, Nico's a, a third-year law student who is, um, in addition, you know, as part of his uh, JD program, is pursuing a certificate from our Distinguished Securities Law Program. Um, he was born and raised in Bogota, Colombia, um, and he came to the U.S. to pursue his college education in 2013 through an athletic scholarship uh, from. Uh, GW, George Washington University, and the varsity men's squash team. Um, after earning his bachelor's degree in economics, he took a year off to work as operations director for a small, a small sports management company um, and uh, got ready for law school. Um, in 2018, he was accepted to our law school and in, 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 uh, um, you know, the, the rest is history. Um, he's engaged in uh, lots of extracurricular activities been a leader, a student leader at our school, in addition to an outstanding, you know, student student worker, including in our, you know, in uh, uh, Director Louise Leiden's um, development office. Um, he has, um, uh, you know, uh, the funny thing is he did the write up for me for this, right? Um, to to tell me what to say about him, right? I know I know Nico and enjoyed him for um, for the two years I've been dean. Um, but of course, he has in here that um, he, um, this, you know, uh, engaging in these extracurricular activities um, that have enhanced his academic experience have allowed him to give back for all the financial, academic, and career support the law school has provided him. And that, that just, that speaks to the spirit of, of Nico Valderrama and what he's meant to our, our school. Um, he serves as the president of the Latin American Law Student Association, 
and engineered the, the first ever Distinguished Alumni Awards for our LALSA um, uh, alums, uh, which went extraordinarily well. Um, he's the vice president of the Security Student Law Association. He's editor for the Catholic University Law Review and research assistant for Professor Emerita Leah Wortham. Um, in prior semesters, he took on roles as uh, a competing member on the Securities Law Moot Court competition team and uh, as class representative on the Pro Bono Advisory Board. Um, while he's been in, in our law school, he's had an opportunity to advance his career through internship and job opportunities, um, including serving as a student as a student attorney for the Columbus Community Legal Services, our, uh, our, our main clinic at the law school, the low income tax payer clinic at the law school, and as a legal intern for the front office of the legal vice presidency of the World Bank. Um, last, since last summer, he's been serving as a legal intern with the Investment Company Institute, or ICI. And now at uh, ICI, he especially enjoys exploring the world of investment management and applying what he's learned in his security law courses to that work. Um, this spring, he'll become the first in his family to have pursued an education in the US and, and the first to earn a law degree. Um, he's accepted a postgrad position with the ICI in their Washington DC office. We're very proud of him. Um, he's been an excellent student and will be an ex excellent alum. Um, so I give you Nico Valderrama. Nico, so glad to have you with us. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining and for allowing me to be with you today. And thank you, Dean Payne, for that kind introduction. Um, I know I provided the write-up, but your remarks were extremely um, kind. Um, I would echo Commissioner Carr's comments, and I would like to commend you for the terrific job that you've done at leading our law school um, through this past turbulent year. Um, thank you, Nico. Thank you so much, Commissioner Carr, for your thoughtful remarks as well, and for sharing your story. Uh, many, of our, many of my peers have had the opportunity to intern at the SEC, um, and I know it's incredibly inspiring for all of us to see a CUA law alum lead such an important federal agency. Um, so I'd like to share a bit more about the impact of the scholarships that many of you support. I really hope that my story serves to shed a light on the powerful effect <clears throat> that scholarships can have on our law school community. What a part of the campaign didn't mention is that the first uh, weeks of my 1-0 year, my family and I faced some unexpected financial difficulties, um, which really impacted the sense of financial security that I had when I made the decision to come to law school. Fortunately, at Catholic, I found the support that I needed, specifically with the help of the people in the admissions office, the Dean of Students, and OCPD, I was able to tap into additional scholarship funds. And I was able to secure two on-campus jobs, and as Dean Payne mentioned, one of them at the Law School's alumni office um, to cover my living expenses. The scholarships that I've received have undoubtedly helped me support uh, myself financially, cover my tuition, and significantly reduce my financial burden. But what's more, um, that first job at the alumni office really exposed me to the numerous individuals, including alumni, who are behind the generous scholarships that my peers and I receive. I witnessed firsthand that beyond just providing financial support, donors actively root for success and are eager to help future generations of law students. While working at the alumni office, I had the opportunity to attend the same event in 2019, where, dean De where then Dean Jefferson presented the Dean Dinner Scholarship Star Award to Kathleen Abernathy. Uh, quite ironic that uh, Commissioner Carl also mentioned uh, Ms. Abernathy. Um, and then Dean Jefferson also uh, gave the award to Joseph Peter Drennan back then. One of the panelists shared some advice that has stuck with me ever since. We're given two hands, one to pull ourselves forward and the other to pull those behind us. Such words have motivated me to strive for my goals, but also to do everything I can to support the people around me. And this is where the exponential impact of scholarships comes in. Your investment in me has really allowed me to not only succeed in my career, but it has given me the opportunity to pay it forward to my peers. Ultimately, I look forward to inspiring and encouraging my peers to keep this cycle of support going for generations to come. But don't take my word for it. Let me give you some examples. As Dean Payne noted, some of the ways I try to give back for the support that I've received 
are by, save, are by serving as president of the Latin American Law Student Association, or LAUSA, the vice president of the Securities Law Student Association, and as a note and common editor for Law Review. With LAUSA, our eWorth efforts have paid handsome dividends, as we've managed to help many of our student members obtain academic resources, build their networks, get paired with mentors, find internship opportunities, get scholarships, and even develop their legal skills by participating in moot court competitions. Similarly, with the Securities Law Student Association, where eWorth has been able to share internship opportunities in the field of securities law, host career development panels and networking events, and support our team of students participating in a securities law moot court competition. Finally, with Law Review, I had the pleasure of guiding six staffers through the writing process, helping them to develop impressive papers for potential publication and writing samples for future employment. I'm thrilled to share that four of those staffers will be editors for Law Review next year, with one of them taking my current role. Now, I like to think that from all the law students that I've been able to help through this initiative, most, if not all of them, are incredibly helpful and uh, grateful. Further, being conservative, let's assume that at least 10 to 20% of them might even feel encouraged to pay it forward, whether that's by taking on leadership roles with student organizations or simply connecting fellow students to job opportunities. Overall, these are numerous lives that you have been able to impact albeit indirectly, through your investment in just one law student, me. Now, multiply that by the number of law students who, like me, receive generous scholarships from the law school and who have made it a point to give back for the support they receive. And then the cycle continues. As for me, your support has truly enabled me to succeed in my career. As Dean Payne uh, gracefully, gracefully, gracefully mentioned, in a few weeks, I'll become the first one in my family to earn a law degree. And um, actually, in a couple of days, my journal article, article uh, analyzing the Securities and Exchange Commission's liquidity rule, which I'll, I might as well mention, uh, Jeff Purit, who's on the call with us today, was my expert reader. And I'm incredibly grateful for all the guidance he provided. Um, in a couple of days, that article is going to be published with our Catholic University Law Review. Uh, and as Dean Payne also mentioned, I'm, I'm incredibly honored to have accepted a position with the ICI or the Investment Company Institute here in Washington, DC, uh, which will allow me to build upon the coursework that I've completed in securities law here at Catholic. Former First Lady Michelle Obama once said that success isn't about how much money you make, but it's about the difference you make in people's lives. Well, by that measure, it seems to me like you're all quite successful already. From the bottom of my heart, I want to thank you for your investment in CUN Law and in students like me. I can only hope to one day be able to invest in students' goals, just as you have invested in mine. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Nico, um, for those inspiring words and for your inspirational example throughout the time that, uh, that I've been at the law school. And I know that many others feel that way as well. So um, we're, we'll all uh, uh, continue to support you and, and root for you, but we're very happy that you're so supportive of us and rooting for us too. Uh, so you know, to be um, graduating from law school and thinking about paying it forward, we can't ask for more than that um, at, at, at this stage. So. Uh, thanks very much. And, and thank you to all, all of you for, uh, for joining us and for your support for scholarships. Um, you can see what kind of impact uh, that support has. Um, and at our school, a little goes a long way. Um, and uh, and a, a lots of little adds up to a lot. So um, we're really, really thankful uh, that you're willing to uh, participate in, in benefits like this and all, all the other things that you do for the law school, financial and otherwise. Um, thank you for a great evening. Thank you again to Commissioner Carr um, for your remarks and for your support. Um, thank you to our um, you know, great staff, uh, to, to Kate Smith, to Louise Lydon, um, to our whole uh, development uh, staff. Thank you to all the uh, technology folks um, who support these events and, you know, um, are kind enough to stay on with us behind their dark screens uh, to make sure that we don't screw anything up. Uh, really appreciate your support and uh, look forward to 
the next event with you, which I hope will be in person. So thank, thank you everybody for joining us and we'll call it an evening. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Great meeting. Thank you.